When you look at a brain, the first thing you'll probably notice is its texture. It's got this characteristic wrinkliness, a series of deep fissures called sulci. Singular is sulcus, which is Latin for furrow, trench, ditch, or wrinkle. Apparently literally means the result of plowing. Between these deep fissures, uh, the brain kind of bulges out. These are called gyri, singular gyrus, which is Latin for circle. And this is the same origin as words like gyroscope or even gyro sandwich. Gyroscope because they spin in circles and gyro sandwich because the meat from them comes from a spinning vertical rotisserie. The main part of the brain is called the cerebrum, which is just Latin for brain. You've probably heard this in the term cerebral. The cerebrum has two halves, which are called hemispheres. And if you look down between them, you'll see that they're connected by this sort of tough, flat band of nerve fibers, which is called the corpus callosum. Uh, corpus means body, and callosum means tough, as in callus, like tough skin. So this basically means tough body. Under the back of the cerebrum is this little sort of extra wrinkly lump that kind of looks like a second miniature brain. And that's called the cerebellum which is the diminutive form of cerebrum, so it's basically called the mini-brain. Finally, emerging from the bottom of the brain, we have the brain stem, which leads down into the spinal cord. If you were to cut into the brain, you would notice a distinct region all around the surface of the cerebrum, about two to four millimeters thick. This is called the cerebral cortex, from Latin for tree bark, so it's kind of like the outer husk or shell of your brain. Because it's a little bit darker, we refer to it as gray matter. The gray matter of the brain is where most of the cell bodies are, and also a lot of capillaries to deliver blood to them. Beneath that is the white matter, which is mostly composed of the axons of neurons. Axons being the long fibers that neurons use to send their output signals to other regions of the brain. So this is kind of like the wiring of the brain, and it's white partly because these fibers are covered in an insulating material called myelin. If you look closely, most of the cerebral cortex is divided into six different layers, these layers all have different characteristics, these types of neurons and types of connections between them, which serve different computational goals, we believe. And these little circuits then send their outputs via the white matter to other parts of the brain. So if one part of the brain wants to talk to something in the other hemisphere, it'll send its information across the corpus callosum to the other hemisphere, where another part of the cortex can process it. For a long time, the surface of the cerebrum was thought of as a sort of uniform mess of wrinkly intestine-looking features. And you can kind of see that in these illustrations from the mid-1500s and 1600s, respectively. This lasted until the mid-1800s, that's less than 200 years ago, when a French anatomist proposed dividing the brain into different lobes based on the bones of the skull above it. The skull around the brain functions as one solid piece of bone to protect it but it actually develops as separate pieces, which fuse together over time, and you can still see the connections between them in an adult skull. So at the front of the skull, you have the frontal bone behind your forehead. Then as you move over to the sides, you have the temporal bones behind your temples, and further along the parietal bones, from Latin parietalis, relating to walls. So these are kind of like the walls of the skull, I guess. And at the very back, we have the occipital bone. This comes from a combination of Latin caput, for head, as in capital, decapitate, or cap, and ob, which in this sense means in back of. So ob, caput, occipital, occipital bone. So by using these skull bones as points of reference, the underlying cerebrum can be divided into lobes. The frontal lobe, behind the frontal bone, the temporal lobes, behind the temporal bones, the parietal lobes, behind the parietal bones, and the occipital lobe, behind the occipital bone. So now we have some ways to refer to different regions of the brain. But if we're going to start to cut into it, make slices, or maybe do some imaging, we're going to want to be able to talk about which way we're slicing it as well. So there's three different planes that we can talk about. The first is the horizontal plane. This is pretty intuitive. It's like the horizon. It cuts the top from the bottom. Then there's the coronal plane. This is from Latin corona for crown. And it goes side to side, kind of like a tiara or a headband. Careful not to imagine this as a horizontal slice. And finally, the sagittal plane, which is the plane that a mohawk would be in. This comes from Latin sagitta for arrow, like Sagittarius. It's a little more unclear where this comes from, but it could be from the image of an arrow piercing the skull from the front to the back, or from the way that the connections between the skull bones look, which if you look from the top and behind, you have these three lines that come together, kind of like the back of an arrow. Um, so it would be that the shaft of the arrow goes along the sagittal plane. Horizontal slices are usually the most oval-looking, as you're kind of cutting through the skull where the brim of a hat would be. And you can see this sort of X shape 
of uh, fluid-filled cavities in the brain, which are called ventricles, same as the heart ventricles. It's from the Latin venter for belly, but it's diminutive, so it's like little bellies in your brain. Coronal sections, you'll often be able to tell, are a bit flatter on the bottom, and you have the two temporal lobes kind of mushrooming out on the bottom sides here. And in sagittal sections, you won't be able to see the split between the hemispheres, since you'll only be going through one hemisphere or the other, and you'll be able to see this more characteristic sort of curved brain shape from the side, with maybe some cerebellum and brainstem under it. So we've split the brain up into different lobes we can talk about, and now we can talk about different ways of slicing those lobes. But if we want to be able to reference the relative locations of things within those slices, we're going to need some more terms for the axes around the brain. So first, I think the easiest are medial and lateral. These are basically how far out from the middle of the brain you are, the mid-sagittal plane where the two hemispheres meet. Medial is from the Latin medius, like middle. Lateral comes from Latin lattice for side. You've probably heard the phrase lateral motion. This is also the root of latitude. Next we have the front-back axis, which are a bit stranger. They're developed originally to refer to different animals, and so we call them rostral and caudal. Rostral is towards your nose. It means kind of the beak or muzzle of an animal. It's originally from the Latin rodere, which is to gnaw or wear something away, like a rodent or erode or corrode. Caudal is from Latin cauda for tail, so it's towards the tail of the animal or towards the back of your head. This is the same root as the word Q, like British people do at a supermarket, or like a ponytail. So if something is rostral, it's closer to the front of your face and your nose, and if something is caudal, it's further towards the back. The last pair is dorsal and ventral. Dorsal is from dorsum, for back. You've probably heard of a dorsal fin, like on a dolphin or a shark. Also related to endorse, if you sign the back of a document to show its approval, you're endorsing it. And ventral is from Latin venter, for belly, as we saw before with the ventricles. So dorsal means towards the back, and ventral means towards the belly. Now this would be pretty clear if you were looking at an animal like a rat or something, which has sort of a clean horizontal uh, line formed by its spinal cord to its brain, and dorsal is always up and ventral is always down. But as the human shape has sort of turned at the top since we're now upright, dorsal refers to up in the brain, but also towards your back in the spinal cord. And ventral does the opposite. It refers to down in the brain and forward in your spinal cord, so towards your throat. There are also the terms superior and inferior, which are used more generally to mean above and below, and anterior and posterior, which mean in front of and behind. So now that we have all these terms, we can combine them and describe pretty specific locations around the brain and have this common language. For example, if you want to talk about the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we can break that apart, see what it means. We have dorso, so it's somewhere towards the top. Lateral, so it's out to the side. Prefrontal, so it's just behind the front part of the brain. And cortex, which means the brain's surface. Or maybe you want to talk about the medial temporal lobes, which would be the innermost part of the temporal lobes that are closer to the middle of the brain. So hopefully with these basic terms, you'll be able to understand what people are referring to when they talk about different locations on the brain. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, thanks for watching.